Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the fished-up General Carlton? Here we are. Enjoy! Looking into the clear water off the coast of Debki, Poland, the fishermen were puzzled by what their nets were snagged on. Below their ship, they could see the remains of another ship. Their nets were getting tangled in the wreckage. The village of Debki had always been a fishing village, and it was one with a strong tradition of oral history. When one of the fishermen mentioned the snagged nets to one of his neighbors, his neighbor recalled a story. It was the story of an English ship which had been wrecked on a sandbar in a storm, taking all of her men with her. This was the story that the fisherman, now a much older man, told archaeologists who decided that in a region with such a long memory, a story of this sort was worth looking into. Local legend had not preserved the name of the ship, or even what type of ship she had been, but the team of divers were in luck. A large storm had removed most of the sand from her, and they were able to find the ship's bell, one of the most dependable ways to identify the wreck. The team had located the wreck of the General Carlton of Whitby. The General Carlton had been built in 1777 and was named after the governor of Quebec, one of the men who led British troops during the American Revolution. The 500-ton General Carlton was a collier, built to carry cargo and sail with a shallow draft for sailing on rivers and harbors without too much danger. With Whitby a major port for the Baltic trade, it did not take long for the General Carlton to join the ranks of ships sailing across the Baltic, even though she had been originally built to carry coal between the Tyne and the Thames rivers. Soon, like her namesake, she was to see action tied to the American Revolution. With the French joining the war, the Baltic was no longer as safe as it had once been. Outside of Whitby, French privateer vessels were seen, prowling for prey leaving for the Baltic trade. Lloyd's Register notes that the General Carlton now had cannons, which she had not previously had. The war touched the General Carlton in other ways as well. It was engaged in the lumber trade, which was one of the trades considered essential to the country. It is fully possible that the entire ship was under exemption from the press gangs that went out from the British Navy to get the sailors that they so badly needed. With merchant ships paying significantly better, and generally treating the sailors better as well, it was unlikely for a sailor to make the choice to join the Navy willingly when there was room on a merchant ship. Even if the entire ship had failed to qualify for exemption from the press gangs, the crew were able to apply individually, and at least one of the apprentice seamen, registered as a servant of the official register and roll, was able to gain one due to his apprenticeship. During archaeological surveys of the shipwreck, enough fragments of this document were found to allow people to read it and determine what it was. A significant historical find, and not a very common one. The war also brought more demand, which was good for merchants. The General Carlton and her cargoes of tar and wood were much sought after naval supplies, and she was now able to trade with the Royal Navy Yards directly. There were yet more opportunities to be had, though, and in 1782, the General Carlton was leased, along with her crew, to the Navy Transportation Board as a transport ship. A large force of transports were needed in a hurry by the Navy, with Cornwall surrendering and the war almost over. There was a lot to be done quickly. The task assigned to the transports was twofold. First, they needed to transport American prisoners of war to New York to be exchanged for British prisoners of war. Then, they needed to evacuate the major locations where there were British troops and loyalists to where they would be safe in Jamaica. The General Carleton was sent to Savannah to aid with this effort. Once this was all over, the General Carleton was able to return to England, though it is likely that the voyage was not a kind one to her. Many other ships sprang leaks during their time in Jamaica and on their voyage back, though nothing was noted about what condition the General Carleton was in. With the war over and her services no longer needed for the Navy, the General Carleton was able to return to her regular Baltic trade, her guns removed, and her original nature as a collier restored. She would continue to trade until September of 1785. 
the first part of the month, the weather had been good and there was little to warn that a large storm was brewing. The storm of the 26th of September, 1785, was noted in Lloyd's list as one that damaged many ships, though the General Carleton was not mentioned. The news of her fate had not reached England yet. It was not until October 21st that the news of her sinking was noted. It took time for news to travel, especially with smaller ships that sank in small villages. When the storm caught the General Carleton, it had clearly found itself in some trouble, listing badly to one side as water got in. It was enough trouble that the ship attempted to find shelter. It was supposed that it had attempted to reach Danzig, but had been in too much distress, and it had stopped at Debke to make emergency repairs. If the tales told by the fishermen of Debke to one another are to be believed, the circumstances of her sinking are as follows. First, her rudder had broken off near Debke, leading the men on board of her to anchor their ship and go ashore while waiting for the weather to clear enough that they could fix it while being safe on dry land. Here they found shelter in a house where they were fed and given a good deal to drink by their host. The next day, after the crew returned to their ship, another storm came in which sank their ship. According to the story, however, on hearing the drunk men tell stories of riches on their boat, and while sailors of the General Carleton were still passed out drunk, their host snuck out and rode out to the General Carleton, where he took everything that looked valuable. He then buried it on the dunes so that it would not be discovered, and he would not be found out as a thief. Once the General Carleton sank, he took some of his treasure and moved away. But when he came back to remove the rest, the shifting sand of the dunes made it impossible for him to find. How much of the story has been embellished over the years is hard to say. It does seem somewhat unlikely that a ship that was carrying tar and lumber just as it always had would suddenly add valuables to their business, something that they did not seem to have been well equipped to carry. What is shown by archaeological evidence is that there is a strong chance that the ship was anchored at one point. If she had not been and it simply drifted, she would have crashed into the sandbank that was her demise with her side. Instead, she struck her stern against the sandbank, suggesting that she had had some restraint which had determined her direction of travel. This suggests that either her anchor slipped from its purchase and no longer gripped the sea floor, or that the cable was cut in an attempt to ground the sinking ship on shore to save the lives of the sailors. As her stern struck the sandbank, it caused a large hole in her, causing seawater to rush in. The General Carleton went down quickly, with the waves of the storm crashing over her. The story that all the men on board drowned, however, is called into doubt. Some accounts said that, as did the fishermen of Debke. But the Lloyd's List announcement of the wreck said that three men survived, and historians think they might have even verified the survival of one of the sailors. The role of sailors is of little use as well. Sailors came and went, and the list had been made some time before. It is possible that more men drowned than suspected, but it is also possible that more men survived than had been noted. It is something that will probably never be known. What is known is the historical importance of the General Carleton as an archaeological site. Wrecks of collier vessels of its time are very rare, and the tar cargo protected many of the artifacts that had at one time been stored in sea chests. A rare glimpse into the personal items of common merchant sailors. There is the exemption from impressment, as already made mention of, but there is also a good deal of clothing and the ship's stove or camboose. These are the artifacts of daily life, but as these are goods that have rarely been preserved or treasured in their time, it makes them valuable finds for anyone who wants to learn more about how sailors lived in the late 1700s. People have already taken it upon themselves to reproduce the knitted goods that were found, and a good deal of interest has been taken in the cambus since ship stoves are rarely recovered. The value of the General Carleton is less what she did before she sank, and more what she shows us while she lays under the water. For more information, please see The General Carleton Shipwreck, 1785, from Archaeological Research of the Polish Maritime Museum, Volume 1, and our other sources in the description below.
Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.